Um, I see Wendy Hicks in here, Zero Cool, Frank the Tank, Green Jedi Monkey, Paula Carroll, um, Mark Hartley, and let's see, Laura Taylor, Mysopods with me, and Cindy Skinks, Magnificent Animals, Ashara White. Who else is here? Wow, we, we had a lot of people come in. We've got 20 people in here, 10 likes already. Heather Jensen's here. Glad to have her back here. Okay, and Frank the Tank, you're right. This is um, Black Hoffman's Egg Guy right here. Having a bit of a snack. Um, what we're going to do, oh, I see that Steven Sager's here, R.I. Naturals as well. What I thought we'd do as we talked about isopods and plants, I, I wanted to uh, look at some bins and kind of uh, spruce up these bins. Like I said uh, before, I have my kids uh, earn a bit of money by, um, they earn a bit of money by helping me take care of isopods. And some of the things they do is they add fresh leaves to the bins, um, they feed, they water, that kind of stuff. Um, but one thing they don't do is change the substrate. Um, I, I do that myself. But I'm getting to the point with over 100 bins that uh, if I do two or three bins every week, it's still going to take me, you know, about a year to get through all the bins. And I thought, hey, well, if we could do a few bins while we're talking, that might not be such a bad thing. And then you can you can see the bins as I'm sprucing them up and just kind of get an idea of how this goes. So I see Mr. and Mrs. Morelli and Theropod Hunter just joined in. Gecko Man 11, Sean Meister, Amber Truckleman, Blast Cat. Cool. And there's Looch and Sabertooth Inverts. Yeah, Sabertooth Inverts, in fact, had some questions on Patreon. I'm going to pull up Patreon right here. Um, and see if I can get to those questions. Okay, so one of the questions was, um, if plants are good to add to isopod enclosures, are live plants beneficial to them? Which plants are good for them? How would you change the substrate mix? Do you need to add a drainage layer? Um, where do you buy? isopod safe plants things like that and you suggest cleaning and sanitizing quarantine purchasing purchase plants before adding them in with the isopods okay lots of good questions um so all right naturals these are hoffman's egg eye black they look a little like flavo marginatus because they do have a, a skirt like them their skirt isn't quite as wide and they're these have a, a much more elongate body and they're also a, a larger isopod see Ian alicia is here as well Oh, yeah, this stuff does make great fertilizer. Um, for US or APHIS purposes, you got to freeze it first. But yeah, once it's been frozen for 72 hours, it makes excellent fertilizer. So I want to start out with saber tooth inverts question, and we'll go on to some other questions we had. Um, so, first of all, if it's beneficial to add isopod um, plants live plants died isopod enclosures i would say that in most cases the isopods don't necessarily need live plants in their enclosures and because many isopods oh look at all these guys many isopods are a little bit uh you know photophobic that in many cases the ideal situation for plants there's a whole bunch more right there too um the ideal situation in most bins that i have um, it, it's not perfect for isopods, but I will say that when I have isopods in a bioactive, you know, they tend to do really well in there. Ooh, just dropped my phone right on my foot. That was fun. Um, they tend to do really, really well in a lot of bioactive setups as long as they get what they need. And I think the bioactive setups are a really good place for the isopods. I also think that, you know, some isopods will eat live plants and the uh, fresh uh, live plant material is good for them it's good variety in their diet can be a good source of water and various nutrients so yeah i think uh, live plants can be beneficial for isopods in those ways it can also help process waste and so on i do think the uh, kind of substrate that i use 
uh, here in this bin, for example, would not be ideal for plants. And that uh, when I have used isopods in um, setups, I tend to use, I'm a little more picky about what substrate I use. I would say that, you know, I tend to use a, a commercial substrate like uh, the BioDudes substrates or with dart frogs and isopods, you know, I'll use any herpeticulture substrate, um, different things like that. I've used instinct habitat substrate and uh, my Thai exotic substrate and so on when I'm doing the combination of plants and isopods um, with the idea that the substrate I'm getting is a substrate that has been designed specifically to support plant growth and support isopods living on it in a bioactive sort of situation. So it's going to have different characteristics in terms of drainage, probably different uh, characteristic in terms of water retention and uh, the way it drains, that kind of thing. Um, so I would say, yeah, I would probably go for one of those specific substrates and not try to build my own necessarily, unless I did a lot of research on uh, what I would do there. Um, so let's see. Favorite sources for buying and learning terrarium vivarium plants that are safe for isopods? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple. Um, one is neherpeticulture.com. It stands for New England Herpeticulture. Uh, and for short, it's neherp, but the website is neherpeticulture.com. And another one is the BioDude. And I just think it's the biodude.com. And I have purchased substrates from both of them and other supplies uh, and like them, can recommend them. I've had good experiences with them. Been working with any herpeticulture since I got my first morning geckos and my first isopods. Uh, what feels like a million years ago, and even though it wasn't, it was more like 10 years ago, I guess. And I've been working with BioDude not quite that long, but still a long time. And I'm happy with what I've uh, gotten from BioDude as well. Ooh, sorry, tripping over stuff here. So I would say those are two um, sources that I respect and trust. I know that the BioDude sells, um, well, at least as far as I remember, um, the BioDude sells plants that are organic and should be pretty safe. They're organically grown and should be pretty safe for vivarium. And uh, I really also like um, any herpeticultures plant processing treatment. What they do, basically, you um, take the plants before you put them in a uh, tank and you make sure they're really hydrated. And then you add some they have a specific thing on their website, their plant processing. If you look up any herpeticulture.com plant processing, it'll tell you the exact proportions. I always look it up every time I do it because I can't remember it. Um, certain proportion of bleach to water. So first you hydrate the plants, then you put them in this uh, bleach to water solution for just a very short period of time. And again, I look up the time every time I do it too, so I don't mess it up. And um, that tends to remove anything that's on the plants in terms of hitchhikers, uh, but it also tends to break down any pesticides or anything that would be adhering to the leaves or the stems of the, or the roots of the plants. And so it can be a really good way to help um, prepare the plants. Um, so lessens the need for quarantining, improves the uh, success rate of having plants you're going to put in there that aren't going to cause problems for your creatures. And I've had really good results with that. There are plants you can't process with the bleach solution. Some of the more sensitive ones like uh, Telanceas, for example, and they just suggest that you immerse those in water for several hours and um, that can help, you know, accomplish the same thing in a gentler way. So um, hopefully that helps with that. I think it was a great question and Sabretooth Inverps, let me know if I covered anything, uh, if I covered that uh, fairly well. A lot of isopods will eat plants and that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today. Um, Sabertooth inverts also, also mentioned that Armadillidium vulgari will annihilate Fetonias, which are a small, um, attractive little veined, uh, the, the veins of the leaves stand out and they're, they're attractive plants for use in terrariums and so on. Um, yeah, Armadillidium are one of the most uh, notorious plant-eating genera among isopods. There are others that will do it too. I'm going to bring up um, three that are pretty well known for eating plants. Um, Cubaris marina, just about anything in the Armadillidium genus, and uh, Venezilo parvus are, are big plant eaters. But there's more that we need to um, talk about when it comes to that. 
Um, one thing that I would love to say, and I think needs to be said, is that um, it's not just about the species. The species certainly makes a difference. Those three uh, taxa that I mentioned, Venezuelo parvus being one species in the Venezuelo genus, I'm not sure about the other species in that genus. Um, Cubaris marina, again, there, there are some Cubaris that will probably eat plants more than others. And then most in the Armadillidium genus tend to be plant eaters. That doesn't mean that there aren't other isopods that will eat plants. There, there are other isopods that eat plants. Um, it it's, has to do with the species. It has to do with what the isopods have access to in terms of food, what the isopods have in access, to, access to in terms of hydration, and uh, the state of the plants. So if you have a healthy plant, some isopods will be fine leaving a healthy, thriving plant alone. And as soon as that plant starts to uh, go south in terms of condition, starts to soften a little bit, whatever, then the isopods will swarm it and go after it and kill it. Um, so that's that's a thing too in some situations. Uh, and also, how much are they eating? How much do, uh, food do these isopods have access to? If they are starving, many isopods that would normally um, be completely content leaving a certain plant alone might decide that, nope, I'm just too hungry now uh, because uh, I haven't got enough food. And I think the analogy that I've used before is uh, if you put a rust in a house and uh, with a property and a fence around it, and he can't leave the property, and he has a big thriving garden and a full refrigerator, and there are some little rabbits running around in the backyard, and they're friendly rabbits. He's not going to harm those rabbits. He has enough in his refrigerator, and um, he's good. And he has got a garden, and the garden is protected from the rabbits and so on. But if you were to uh, stop providing him with food, it wouldn't be too long before he'd start thinking about eating those rabbits. Sorry, that's kind of graphic, but that's, I mean, that's kind of how isopods are. They're opportunists, and as long as they have plenty of um, opportunities to eat, they're going to be a little more uh, picky about what they eat, and they're going to stop being picky as soon as um, they run out of uh, options. They'll eat almost anything once they... Uh, Run out of options. No. I just think I successfully I've successfully replaced about three quarters of the substrate in this Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye black bin. Um, I boosted the moss. It needed some refreshing. Um, and I boosted the leaf litter in there. So I'm gonna switch to another bin now. And uh, we can keep talking. I do have another comment from Someone, I gotta pull that up here, see where that is. I think it's on the a comment on the ice pods versus slide plant posting I did. This was from Jill Engel, a new patron. Um, said, should I be using live moss in ice pod enclosures? If so, how do I ensure it's safe for them? And I'm not inadvertently importing non-native critters in the moss. Okay, well, um, you don't necessarily need to be using uh, moss in live moss in your ice pod enclosures. It will tend to get eaten with a lot of the isopods. Many, many isopods will eat moss, especially ones like armadillidium. But I wouldn't limit the moss eaters to armadillidium. Moss seems to be a favorite of many isopods. Now we're going to look at this gestroy enclosure here and do the same thing. This is an enclosure with lots of little gestroy and a few big ones. <laughs> so we're going to take a peek at that here. Um, Look at all these little gestoid everywhere. So I would say that you don't necessarily need to put the moss in. You can, but do definitely be prepared for it to be uh, munched if it's armadillidium and, and not necessarily just limiting yourself to armadillidium. There are a lot of isopods that will eat that moss. And if you want to treat it so that it's not going to introduce pests, because that could be a thing for sure, you can introduce all kinds of things to um, your enclosure with moss. Um, one thing you can do, and I've, I've used this method to introduce plants, is to use the, the uh, dry ice method. And that's basically get a small amount of dry ice and put whatever plants you're processing in a container that is uh, fairly deep and mostly airtight, uh, but not quite, not quite airtight. You don't want to get it airtight completely because if you do, you can cause uh, some issues. Uh, with the uh, 
you know, popping the lid off and that kind of stuff. And depending on how tightly the lid seals, that could be a real problem. You could accidentally cause some damage by causing an explosion as uh, CO2 builds up. So it's basically an enclosure that um, doesn't have a lot of ventilation, but it's key that it does have some. Um, and then you can get a small, small piece of dry ice, just a small one. Don't want to add too much. And again, do this at your own risk. But I've done this. And so that there's definitely airflow, but most of the airflow is coming out of the top so that um, CO2 can pool down at the bottom of the enclosure, but still escape out of the top. Um, and you do, don't want to use very much dry ice because you don't want, uh, you know, to cause problems for yourself breathing in your house or anything by reducing the oxygen by so much CO2 in the house that you're pushing out oxygen, that kind of stuff. So there are some things you need to be aware of and be careful about. But if you are careful, you can you can do that and then put all the plants, including the moss, and I would recommend doing this with damp moss, um, put that in the bottom of the enclosure and then get like a little a uh, glass plate or a plastic lid or something like that. Set the small piece of dry ice on top of that. And then what happens as it sublimates into the, uh, into the container, the CO2 will pool down at the bottom and slowly rise up. And the plants will be down at the bottom. They'll be covered by a layer of CO2. And there won't be any oxygen or very little oxygen in that container. And you can let it sit there for several hours. And anything that needs to breathe, uh, you know, that needs to breathe oxygen won't be okay, will we'll tend to die. Um, and the plants aren't hurt by, a, you know, they're getting a supercharged dose of CO2, and it's not going to hurt them for a few hours to do that. The CO2 is good for plants, right? And you let them go too long without oxygen, they can have problems. But um, I've found that that is super effective. Um, one thing to keep in mind as a caveat is that, especially if you're doing this with the moss being dry, um, then you could have some creatures in diapause that basically need little to no oxygen while they're in diapause, like a dry tardigrade, for example. Uh, doesn't really need oxygen while it's dry, and once it gets moist, it does again. So I do recommend doing this to the moss moist, um, so that anything that was dry, uh, you know, you're not going to have things being protected by being dry during the CO2 treatment. And that is one way to do it. So I hope that helps. Um, but once again, you don't necessarily need to put moss in there, and it will get munched by many species of isopods, especially armadillidium. Uh, let's see, I have a one from Kate L. Curious about armadillidium maculatum? Have them in a tank now and would love to blend up with peperomia, hoya, or snake plants, perhaps. I'm not finding conclusive information about what they will and won't eat, but then the harder plants will tend to go uneaten. I have dairy cows in planted tank I'm preparing for my corn snake, and they don't really seem to bother the plants unless there's a fallen leaf that's easy to reach. Yeah, I think. That species tends to be fairly uh, innocuous towards plants as long as everything's going well. So that's probably a safe bet. Um, as long as they have enough food and so on. I would think the zebras, harder plants is kind of a good rule, but I don't know if we have like a huge amount of documentation on uh, exhaustive lists of which plants isopods will leave alone and which ones they won't. Um, we can say, I'll tell you that snake plant is a pretty good option. I have a snake plant in with my, in my garter snake enclosure. Sorry about the airplanes flying by. They always tend to do that. Um, putting some more moss in. Um, I would say that snake plants are pretty tough plants. And if you're going to keep a plant with isopods, it's a pretty good bet. In with my garter snakes, like I was saying, I have a snake plant and I have Porcelio dilatatus, the giant canyon isopod, in there. And it does really well in there. The uh, giant canyon will eat the dead leaves of the snake plant. It will not bother the other leaves. It's pretty nice. I think I'm covering up a couple of little gestures, but it's not going to hurt them because I'm not going to pack down the soil or anything. They'll dig out. Not an issue. So th they will eat the dead leaves, but they leave the live leaves alone, and the plant's doing really well in with the, in the garter snake enclosure. So. I would say Hoyas are pretty tough, thick-leaved plants too, and that would be my suspicion that you'd have a similar reaction from the isopods. Can't be for sure, and you know, Armadillidium is not going to be the safest isopod genus to, to put in there, just for that reason. So Armadillidium maculatum, you're gonna, there's a little bit of a risk there that there might not be with some other species, but uh, you know, those tougher plants are going to be a better bet. So hopefully that helps. 
So Jotaro, the powdered oranges and the dairy cows, um, if they are tiny dairy cows and not something like Oreo crumbles, then they're indeed a different species and a different genus altogether. Oreo crumbles look a lot like little dairy cows. In pattern, they're very similar. They do have the exact same body type, body shape, and everything as the powdered oranges because they are the same species, but the pattern is very similar to dairy cows. So that could be possibly going on, but if they are indeed dairy cows, they're not the same species, won't interbreed. I've heard some people having a lot of success keeping them together and other people not so much. Uh, you can see how it goes or you can try to separate them out, but uh, sort of a going to be a little risky just because you know two different species if one if the conditions in the enclosure start favoring one over the other you're probably going to have some some competition that uh, is going to result in one of them winning out and Aaron's isopods I've had dairy cows in bioactive enclosures for long periods of time as well without any particular issues where the plants and the dairy cows both thrive so I would I would tend to agree with you that it hasn't been a big issue. They will eat the dead leaves, but I haven't had a big issue with uh, dairy cows eating the plants. So, Yotaro, a different way to tell the difference between the dairy cows and the Oreo crumbles. Well, the body shape is quite different. Um, there are some other ways that are a little bit trickier to do, especially if they're tiny, but um, the body shape is going to be quite different uh, in that the dairy cows have a much stockier body. Even when they're younger, they're going to have a stockier body. Uh, they're going to be a little bit less uh, velvety in many situations, most levels of humidity, especially drier, slightly drier. The, um, the Oreo crumbles are going to have a velvety look to them, which does become less apparent in uh, higher humidity and also is less apparent when they're younger. But as they grow, um, you should be able to see um, the difference. And then as they get bigger, you know, the dairy cows are going to out uh, class the, uh, the powdered oranges by in size very, very quickly. It's going to be crazy uh, how much bigger they get and how much stockier. So hopefully that helps. Okay. So we just did the dairy cows, not the dairy cows. Got dairy cows on the brain. Look at this big old gestroy over here. It's a it's a pretty nice one. I have some that are bigger. I have some huge ones in my office enclosure of gestroy, but uh, that's that's a decent size one. I, I love how they get so big. I'm gonna make sure I put some food in their shell right here before I put them away because I'm sure they're hungry. Should give them a snack, right? Where did I just put the the food? I just had it. Not sure where I put it. Sorry, everybody. This is embarrassing. I can't find the food. Where was it? Hmm. Okay, well, I have another one over here. Just dropping things. Sorry, everybody. Um, I do have the Zinger mor Morph. Uh, I'm not sure how to say your name. S-X-R-R-Y. How do you pronounce that? Uh, but I do have the Zinger Morph. Maybe we can show some of those. They're, they're actually pretty fantastic. So maybe I, I'm going to grab them uh, and just show them for a second while uh, I transition to another bin. I should actually do their bin pretty soon. Um, it's a younger bin, so I don't need to do it as soon. Let's see. Here, here are a bunch of zingers. There's there's some adults down there. You can get a good look at them, hopefully. There's a lot in here, you can see. There's, eh. I lost some of the adults eventually. Once they get to a certain size, you know, they're probably going to pass on not too long. But uh, I got loads of babies in here. I actually want to upgrade this bin to a larger one. Absolutely fantastic morph of Jestroy. The other morph of Jestroy that I really want is the uh, the all yellow morph. They're they're gorgeous. They look like lemon drops. They they just they're gorgeous and they shine. They're fantastic. 
All right. Let's see what kind of questions. More leaves than substrate or more substrate than leaves? I, I say it depends on the species. There are some heavy um, base substrate feeders like Hilaria brevicornis. You definitely want more base substrate and you want a lot of that to be like fermented wood or other microbiologically active wood like kinshi, something like that. And uh, I would say that with some uh, other species that aren't heavy substrate feeders or even just moderate substrate feeders, it's better to have more leaves. Okay, so these are Santa Lucia. They are really cool looking. Look at that one right in the middle of the screen. That is a cool look. I'm trying to focus here. Santa Lucia are a natural polymorphic locality. They come from an island near Spain is my understanding. Some of them look uh, like uh, Japanese pied. Some of them look like Punta Cana. They just, they all look very different. Some are sort of orange, some are wild type looking. And, uh, and in my, uh, I agree with you who just said that. It was Frank de Tank. Santa Lucia has much more variety than Punta Cana. Yeah, most Punta Cana I have seen have a decent amount of variety, but not anywhere near like Santa Lucia. Santa Lucia seem a lot more polymorphic. And I really like that about them. So um, totally agreed, Frank de Tank. It's a thing. I'm, I'm just picking some out here as I'm... Uh, Cleaning out the bin. Got handfuls of Santa Lucia to put back in the in the bin. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, the magic potion genetics. If you put American line magic potion into a lottery mix, you're gonna get some uh, some of that yellow intensification for because that's what they were bred for you're right heather good good point i think you actually isolated some um magic potion looking individuals from your um from your gem mix i would hesitate to call them magic potions because they now have you know a mix of different genes but you can get a magic potion like phenotype that way for sure So, so Laura Taylor, our, this Armadillidium vulgare is a plant muncher. This is not an excellent choice if you want to put these in, a, in an enclosure and you expect to have excellent plant growth and not have it disturbed. Um, Santa Lucia probably going to munch your plants to some degree. And while you might be able to mitigate that with some of the other measures that I mentioned, you know, make sure they have plenty of other food and use tougher plants and that kind of thing. Um, this is, is probably not your best option. So um, chump bada, my understanding, I'm still, I think I'm still on the fence about um, C. convexus, um, Silisticus convexus. I don't, I think it's a pretty good bioactive, well, it is a good bioactive species. I'm still trying to figure out how much is the plant muncher. I don't think it's as bad as some, and it might not be bad at all, but I'm just, I'm still, I still want a little bit more data on Silisticus convexus. I don't feel like I'd put it at the top list of plant munchers, and I do think it's a great bioactive uh, species, uh, and I think it's underrated for that. I think they do well. I just, I just need a little bit more information before I can just um, unreservedly state that it's fantastic for planted situations. And you know, the Tretus cantias, I'm, I'm a little bit curious about the Tretus cantias because, uh, like, uh, the Zib Tretus cantia zebrina, I think it was Frank the Tank who mentioned that, um, it is only mildly toxic, and I'm not sure how much isopods would be deterred. 
by such a mild toxin. Curious about that myself. I've had, when I was a kid, my mom used to throw the Tredescantia clippings into the goldfish tank and they would munch them and they were fine. It would grow in the, you know, it'd root in the, the goldfish tank and grow and everything. And the goldfish would munch on it and it was kind of a little sort of primitive, very primitive sort of aquaponics sort of situation. But uh, the goldfish never suffered from it and did not mind munching on it in the least. So even though there is some mild toxicity to it, I'm not sure if it's toxic enough to deter isopods. I haven't experimented with it enough to know. Oh, hey there. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to get too many isopods. Have your toad in brumation. Yep, sometimes I have thought uh, about uh, just getting a toad as a an isopod cull uh, machine, a cullinator, I guess they call them. Because, you know, sometimes I have to cull isopods and if they're you might as well go to a good use. I've thought about it. I haven't done it. My daughter has a, you know, Pac-Man frog, but she's not particularly comfortable with it eating isopods, so I don't feed it isopods. So Champara, I'm wondering about the Ukraine Pied 2. Um, it, with enough density, they might they, they look super amazing. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, if you got enough density, if you could get a lot of uh, visibility. They're not, the, they're not the boldest of isopods. But with enough density, you might be able to get something going. Mm. Is there a flipped over isopod? Hmm. I missed it. Maybe I poured dirt on it. Well, substrate. I shouldn't call it just dirt. Most overrated isopod. Okay, I did help him. I'm just going to go with rubber duckies. I do think they're cool. I do think they're a little overrated. But there are some others that... I mean, there are some... Uh, there's some Q-bars out there, and I look at them, I say, those look just like, color-wise, just like you know, run-of-the-mill Armadillidium vulgare. They don't, you know, they have the Q-bars characteristics, um, structural characteristics, but color-wise, they just look like an Armadillidium vulgare wild type. Why would I spend that much money to get a Q-bars like that? So there's that too. Throw that out there. It looks like several people agreed with me. Um, dairy cows overrated. Okay. Spiky varieties. So, J Man, how would you go about replacing substrate in a large colony of armed lithium bugatti if exploded and all the substrate is brass? I would just take out uh, half of the substrate and dump it in another container, sift through it, see what I can get out in terms of isopods, leave the, that substrate sitting there. Moisten one side of it, put a hide on one side of it, and feed on that same side. So it's moist, it has a hide, and it has uh, food all on that one side. And then just leave that separate bin for um, several weeks or a little longer and tuck it regularly, moisten it regularly, feed it regularly. And whenever ice pods show up on that side, just uh, take them out, put them in another container. Um, and um, when you feel like you've gotten all the ice pods out, you freeze that substrate, 72 hours, and good to go. That's what I would do. And using the, the fine mesh strainer as part of that process, as Heather is suggesting, is an excellent idea. I, I have used those as well, and they, they're, pretty, they're pretty cool. Okay. There's plenty of leaf litter in there now. Ah, I'm going to add a little bit more. Put the feeder over here. I think we need a little bit more.
spark bark or something in there, to be honest. Let's see. There's a decent piece of cork bark. I'm going to do that. And going to add a little bit of that shouldn't be sitting right on the moss. Going to move some things around. Add a little bit of moss. And we'll be good to go. Okay, what are we looking at? Oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Did not mean to do that. And back to chat. Now, this container, this enclosure has been refreshed. Oh, sorry. I'm going to take a peek at this one. These are Marulanella species Vietnam. And it looks like the leaves have been refreshed very recently. Cool. My uh, children have been diligent about that. You can see a whole bunch of the Marulanella species Vietnam running around in the substrate. They're, they're fast little critters. Um, but it looks like this substrate has been kind of worked over because um, Rulinella species Vietnam, I don't know how they do with plants, to be honest. I've never kept them with plants. But they're really good at staying down in the substrate. And I feel like these would be a good option uh, with something that's fairly... Uh, if you need a cryptic isopod. They do conglobate. You can see them. I don't know if I can focus. This. They conglobate fairly well, not quite as well as some others, but they do conglobate, and they just tend to hide under the substrate quite a bit. And I think that could be great for something like dart frogs or something else with really moist substrate uh, that uh, you want to be fairly cryptic. So theropod hunter, this shrub's dream, what does it become? Is it Nezodilo now, or what, what genus is it? I don't want to throw one out there and find out I'm wrong, but maybe I have just done that. So Ashara White, I have panda kings. We can take a look at them. There's some confusion about those, because some people are saying that they are a just a, a more for a color locality, something like that, of... Cubaris marina. They don't act like Cubaris marina to me. Um, I don't know. They look pretty closely related, but I don't know that they're the same species, but that seems to be what some people are saying. See, there's there's the little Marulanella. You can see that little orange skirt. It's pretty cool. And they don't really conglobate all the way. They make kind of a C shape, which is interesting. At least some of the time. I've never seen one completely conglobate, I don't think. I've just seen one mostly do it. Put the moss over here. Hey, little guy. You go right there. Now I'm going to put some substrate in. Mm, so just bugs. It's not super late. I mean, I've been going for about 38 minutes, I guess. But it's, you know, you're not right at the end, so that's fine. It would be worse if you had come and it was like 58 minutes, because then it would be almost done. So it's not bad. Get a little bit more moss. I do appreciate you all being patient as I'm doing these containers here. I think it's, it's really helpful for me to be able to do some. I might just one live stream a month do some isopod bins while we chat. Um, I don't know. What does everybody think about that? If I did that like once a month or so, would that be cool? Would it be frustrating? What do you think? It does mean I'm not watching the chat quite as attentively as I might be, but... I don't really provide a lot of hides for the Marulanella species Vietnam because they seem to just go right under the substrate. It doesn't like even seem like a a good idea to even bother with um, a lot of hides because they're already using the substrate. They hang out under there so much. Let's see, 
gonna put a little bit of a snack in there for him. As soon as I remember where I put the food, I swear, my memory uh, today has been terrible. I, there it is. And Heather, I like that a family member reading the chat while you work on the bin. You know, I need to do that more. I've had my kids do that one once or twice. Um, generally, when I'm doing live streams, I have my wife is gone with my daughter to my daughter's dance class, but I have other kids who are sometimes here, uh, older kids who are here sometimes during the uh, live stream. So maybe I need to get that going. So it looks like, uh, yeah, we've got some people who are thinking that would be a good idea. So maybe we'll try that. So Cubara's Jupiter Therapod Hunter is surface active. That's good to know. Yeah, I feel like Marulanella isn't. This Marulanella species isn't. I think there's other Marulanellas that aren't. are. Speaking of other Marulanellas, should we take a look at one? Should we take a look at my one and only additional Marulanella species? See how they're doing? My Marulanella species tricolor. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Mel, you like the idea too? That's awesome. Let's go with it. Let's let's do this. We'll try to do like a month of whoa, somebody really put a lot of fish food in there. I'm gonna have to talk to folks about that. But look at that gorgeous little creature. These are out and about. These are on the surface. Um, yeah, these are from Easy Eddie. And if you've not seen um, Easy Eddie's recent uh, appearance on Isobuddies, that's worth a look and a listen. Um, they talked about all kinds of cool things, some some good uh, isopod husbandry ideas and secrets. And uh, Easy Eddie, really cool guy. Just going to check here. It looks like springtails are doing fine in here. I'm going to see if I see any monkai. Is that what I think it is? Does this mean my, my tricolors had babies? I would be over the moon if that's the case. Well, that is a baby isopod. Whether or not it's a tricolor is hard to say. I sure hope it is. Because that means my tricolor just, just reproduced. Now, it could be a stowaway of some other kind, I suppose. I do um, make, um, you know, make efforts to avoid such things. I would be pretty much over the moon if that turns out to be a little baby tricolor. Isn't that cool? So, I'm going to put this back right here. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I was not expecting to see baby tricolors. It looks like this food is just on the verge of getting... Um, just on the verge of rotting. And I think this is one of those situations where it's good that I'm checking the bins fairly frequently because um, my kids do the best they can. They, they definitely try hard. They're hard workers. Oh, there's one. There's one. There's another baby. Oh, shoot. Is it gone? I saw another baby running across this, this shell, and I tried to move it in time. But it definitely looked like a tricolor. It looked a little bit older than the other one. Oh, there it is. There it is. Check it out. Yeah, that looks like a little tiny tricolor. So we've got babies, folks. You saw it here first. That is another baby tricolor. I am excited. So what I was going to say, basically, is that my kids are awesome. And I, I say that unabashedly. They are awesome kids. Uh, sometimes they haven't nailed down all this uh, the uh, husbandry to the point where... You know, I can just leave things alone and let them go. So I'm just checking over here. I want to make sure I don't accidentally remove a baby tricolor uh, while I'm removing this food because that would be the worst thing ever, wouldn't it? Um, but I'm going to put this food into another bin and see if somebody else wants it. Okay. So um, Mr. and Mrs. Morelli is asking how the tricolors are to care for. Well, so far, I'm new to them, but now that they're reproducing, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more confident about it. Um, I've just kept them 
like I keep any other isopod, basically humidity gradient, a little bit more of moist side than some others, decent ventilation, uh, and they seem to do well in the uh, video that uh, I was referencing on isobuddies. Um, Easy Eddie says he gives them a decent amount of ventilation and keeps them on the moist side, I believe is what he said. Seems to be working. So uh, that's exciting. Um, Beetle Guy was asking if I paid my kids. Yes, I do. I, I pay my kids for their work and it helps keep me going because there's no way I could take care of all my critters without my kids helping me. So um, I depend on what they do. I, I absolutely do. Um, let's see, we we're going to get some panda kings. Pulling some panda kings out over here. I can check them out. I'm going to see if I can lower um, the bin here. Make a little, I might make a little um, ridiculous noise as I do this. Not the bin, I'm lowering the camera so you can see better into the bin is what I meant. Um, let's see what we can see here. Nothing right there. So let's pull open some of this bark and take a look. There are a bunch of panda kings right there. Various sizes. Most of those are young ones. Juveniles to uh, sub-adults. There's a bunch under there too. Um, let's see how many are under here. I think they're going to be more. Oh yeah, look at all that. They're all over everywhere. Panda kings. And Frank the Tank, absolutely. Um, too much handling of an isopod that's not quite ready to release the babies from the pouch can cause them to release the babies from the pouch. And that could possibly result, depending on how early it is, could possibly result in the loss of those babies or some of those babies. If it's pretty close to the birth time, then maybe, maybe you could be okay. So red lily dragon. The isopods don't seem to nibble on the uh, shells, the, the seashells, the scallop shells. If I put cuddle bone in there, yes. But as far as the scallop shells, they don't seem to do a whole lot. Um, so those are the panda kings. You can see that there's a decent number of them in here, and they're breeding. They breed pretty well. Seem to be all over in this bin. And there, there are a decent number of them in the substrate and stuff, too. Should probably give them a little bit of food while we're at things here. Put some on their shell as well. Panda kings are, are pretty simple. If you're going to start out with a, a Cubaris, that's one of my top two picks for you to start out with. I would say this one and, and Cubaris Marina are, are great uh, starter Cubaris. And uh, yeah, these are cheaper. I'm, these are cheaper than a lot of Cubaris. Probably not as cheap as Marina is in most cases but uh they're they're not a bad one to start with let's get speaking of cubaris marina i actually want to check my uh my newest cubaris marina morph let's see how they're doing because i'm kind of obsessed with them and it's been a little while since i've checked in on them besides just like you know adding food or whatever so let's see is this the right bin yeah, this is the uh, anemone, and I noticed they were breeding in here. And a lot of the anemones have absolutely fantastic color. Um, they vary a lot, but they look kind of like lava, like Cubaris marina lava. I mean, Cubaris marina lava, like Porcelio scaber lava. And some of them look a little bit more like wild type. Um, let's see. I had a lot of babies in here, so I'm guessing... That there's a bunch in the substrate i'm just kind of digging around. oh yeah yeah there's some of different sizes and shapes in the substrate let me see if i can highlight some of these see them kicking around here i'm going to put some on the shell picking a couple of them up and putting them on the shell so we can take a look because uh, I, I don't think you can see what i'm pointing out with the camera look at that 
See they're kind of a pied orange with dark markings rather than dark with orange markings. I don't know how well that's showing up on the camera. I tend to keep a large quantity, large amount of the substrate for these guys damp. Not all of it. There's a nicely marked one. And there's a little baby. You can see a few there. Um, I tend to keep most of the substrate on the damp side, and some of it is uh, drier. But you can see there's damp enough for springtails everywhere. Lots of leaf litter in there, pretty rich. Oh, I just see some mostly springtails right now, but get an idea. There's one. Get an idea that most of the substrate is damp. I do have some that are drier. Uh, some Cubaris Marina enclosures that are a little drier than this one. So my isopod's favorite food. Good question. I give them a heck of a lot of uh, Supreme Isopod Chow, I'll tell you that. That's a great food for them. They eat a lot of it. Um, one of one of my favorites to give them, and I think they do really well on it. Um, let's see. I want to check out a couple of my Porcelio Scaber while we're here. See if we need to refresh anything. I think I got all the Patreon questions. Hopefully, we were talking about the ice buds with plants, and I think we covered it fairly well. Let's see what we got here. So these are Porcelio Scaber Orange Koi. Looks like you can see some of various ages, which is nice. These are seriously one of my favorite uh, morphs of Porcelio Scaber because um, they're so varied. They're they're super easy to take care of. You get a lot of variation. You get some that are mostly white, like that one I'm trying to focus on. Some that are mostly orange, like that one. But most of them have a decent amount of markings. And you do have to cull them for to select for, for variation. Here's a few more. Easy Eddie sent me some of those. First, um, Wally at Supreme Gecko sent me uh, quite a few, and they were doing extremely well. And then uh, I had a teleportation event. I think what happened is that somebody got a leaf for something stuck up near the side and a bunch of them crawled out and I because I didn't find dead ones in here I just all of a sudden my numbers went from I had a really good number of them doing well to I didn't anymore without any apparent deaths so I'm assuming what happened was that um, we had an escape event isn't that gorgeous though look at that they are absolutely gorgeous so I'm, I'm really glad that uh, I had a few left and I was going to try to build up the colony. They were starting to breed. But then Easy Eddie um, sent me some more. And so now I, I got a jump start on the colony again. And they're doing well. Um, so I do have some lemonade, too. They're pretty neat, too. Oh, there's Don. Don Gallagher's here. Yeah, there's definitely some small, small babies in here. It's fun. So Easy Eddie, I think the easiest way to find him is Edwin Lopez on uh, Facebook. Um, he's Easy Eddie most places, but uh, he's Edwin Lopez on Facebook, and I think that's the easiest way to find him, maybe. I was fortunate enough to uh, have Easy Eddie find me when he wanted to. He was kind enough to want to send me some isopods, and I was excited about that. So he sought me out. I've thought about crossing orange koi with lavas. I, I should try that sometime. Because you'd get such a... I, skewbald tri is something like that, but I think it might be calicos and uh, kois or something. Um, I know uh, Smugbug has those, a skewbald tri. I don't know what they look like in person. I've seen um, pictures of them. <coughs> oh, oh, sorry. I apologize for that. Hmm, surprise me. Um, I think someone was telling me they crossed lavas with um, orange koi, actually. I haven't done it, but it was cool. Yeah, there shouldn't be any uh, reason why these shouldn't be able to cross. Porcelio Scaber all seem to be compatible with each other. I've had people tell me that this 
um, that lava is actually a locality and a subspecies, but it's still still able to cross with others. So um, we should try it. If I do try it, I'll, I will make a video about it. And Frank to Tank, have I noticed my lavas getting duller in color every generation? No, actually, I haven't. I've noticed that they do throw um, some lesser colored individuals, like the one right in the middle right now. It looks basically like a wild type, or almost like a wild type, and I've seen quite a few of those. But I see plenty of them that are not. And you can see that some of the older ones here are just as brightly colored, and there's plenty of smaller ones here that are brightly colored. It's, it doesn't seem to do with the uh, generation. It's just their stock. I think it has to do with selection. And uh, there, there could be some complex genetic things going on here. Uh, there could be something else that's going on here. Some people have talked about there's like a, could be some sort of non deleterious uh, para, like microbial infection or something that causes this chimera look in them. There, there could be a lot of reasons why this is happening. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming selection is, is important and helpful in this. And so if you get any that are super low expression, just throw them in your gem mix or your party mix or whatever, lotto mix. That's what I'm trying to say, lotto mix. And then uh, see what you get like that, that individual. That, that's a candidate for culling into the lotto mix. That one probably is as well. Um, we only have a few minutes. I'm going to look at, uh, I have a couple more. Well, I have like half a dozen Horselio scaber morphs. Um, let's see what we've got here. There's lemonade. We probably have more than half a dozen, actually. I just grabbed a few. This is the ice pod that really started the hobby. Or Celioscaber Orange. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have the isopod hobby if these hadn't shown up. And these were some of my first that I got. Thanks, J-Man. Okay, the chance of getting any sort of color morph of, from isopods or snails from the wild is just random luck, right? Pretty much. And I do have Oniscus acellus. I have three different morphs of it, I think. I, I have, what do I have? I have the Mardi Gras, I have the maple, and I have the wild types. Let me see if I can grab those real quick. Uh, at least one of them. Let's see. Grab my maples. Take a look at the maples. I think these are from two or three different sources, and one of them is fairly recent. I adopted some BC maples to, to refresh my culture, refresh the bloodlines in my culture. See what we got. There's a whole ton of them. There are some gorgeous isopods. Um, they look even better in person, but aren't those pretty? I mean, hard to deny that. The, the glossiness, the saturation, the pattern. Pretty beautiful. Who's asking about Aniscus cells? Anyway, gotta look back and see who that was. Oh, that was S X R R Y. Okay, yeah, they are. They're really pretty. See if there's some more under here. Yeah, the colony is doing okay. Doing pretty well. Well, I'm looking at the clock. Um, I do keep these in the coolest part of my room. Uh, up against a, a wall that stays cool because it's, uh, I think it's an exterior wall maybe, or maybe it's not, I don't know, but it's the coolest part of the room, I think. And they're beautiful. And I hope you all have enjoyed the live stream. I've enjoyed chatting with you all. Thanks for joining in. And please make sure you catch my video on Friday. And if you haven't liked, please give it a like really quick while it's still on so that uh, more people can find uh, Aquarium X Pets. And have a good one. Catch you later.